Hello, my name is Tim Davies and welcome to our FTS online class. Before watching this class, we suggest you watch the introduction class, if you haven't already watched it, that is, because in that class, we provide information on the CFA program, we give some study tips and some exam tips, and we discuss how to prepare for the exam, and we look at the topics that we're going to be covering as we go through our level one course, and also give some background about myself. So I am pleased that Quants is now the first study session because it actually used to be that ethics was the first study session. And I always used to say, let's rather leave ethics for last. The reason being is that we apply many concepts that we learn throughout the curriculum in ethics, especially in the examples. But now ethics is the last study session. So study sessions, we don't have to go through all of that explaining anymore. So quants is the best place to start because we actually use what we learn in quants in many other parts of the curriculum. But let's just talk for one minute about quants. So it is one of the tougher sections, but that's not serious because there are many other sections that are just fine, like financial reporting is fine and corporate finance, or actually they don't call it corporate finance anymore, they now call it corporate issuers. The corporate issuers is fine. Um, equity is a nice section and alternative investments also nothing wrong there. So if we can just get 50% for quants, let's say, and we can get 80 to 90% for some of those other sections, then everything is going to balance itself out. So we mustn't stress about this quants. So we can see in this study session that we've got these three readings over here, and then there is another study session on quants where we've got four more readings to get through. There's, so there's quite a few quants readings that we're going to be covering. And we are then going to be kicking off with the time value of money reading. So let's go there. So let's just talk also then for a minute about time value of money. Now, this time value of money, it's applied in many, many topics throughout the curriculum in all three levels. So we're going to see it a lot in fixed income, especially fixed income. We'll also see it in equity and corporate finance and alternative investments. So everywhere we go, we're going to be coming across this. So on the exam, you know, they, they may they may not be that many time value of money questions, but it definitely is going to be applied to other sections. So it's very important that we know our time value of money well. And just before we get started, you'll see that below this video, there's a, a little spot there to download the slides. I just wanted to mention that in case you didn't see it. So let's get cracking then. The first thing we're going to look at is interpreting interest rates. And interest rates that can be interpreted in three ways. So firstly, it can be a required rate of return. So this is now the minimum rate of return an investor must receive in order to accept the investment. Alternatively, we can look at, look at an interest rate as a discount rate. So here we discount a future amount into the present. So for example, $100 in one year's time, it might be worth $95 today. And then we can also view an interest rate as an opportunity cost of current consumption because the investor could choose to spend his or her money today and then, of course, would not get a return. So if the return is 5%, then the investor would not get that 5%. So that's why we can look at an interest rate then as an opportunity cost. Great, now we need to look at the components of interest rates. And an interest rate, it's composed of a real risk-free interest rate. And then we need to add on four premiums. And the four premiums are these ones over here. Now we mustn't be too worried about these premiums because we are gonna be cover covering them in a lot of detail 
in economics and especially in fixed income. So what we can do now is have a quick look at them in, on this slide, but we will revisit them in a, in a lot more detail later on. So the real risk-free rate then, this is the interest rate for a risk-free security if no inflation were expected. So a security, we can think of it now or for now as an, a financial instrument that's traded in the market. And the rate we normally use is the rate on a government bond of a strong country like America, for example, because that's considered the lowest risk investment that we can find. And then the first premium we need to add on is the inflation premium. So this compensates investors for the expected inflation over the term of the investment. So if we take the real risk-free rate and add on the inflation premium, we get what we call the nominal risk-free rate. So what we could do then, we could maybe put an N up over here because the real risk-free rate plus the inflation premium, we call that the nominal risk-free rate. Then for the default risk premium, this compensates investors for the possibility that the borrower doesn't pay back the money. So if we um, are the investor and then we are going to then lend out our money to a certain entity, then maybe that entity is not going to pay us back our money. So the higher that risk is, uh, the higher risk premium as investors we are going to demand. And then for the liquidity premium, this compensates investors for the risk that he or she may receive less than fair value of the investment if it needs to be converted into cash quickly. So what I'm going to say now might not be that easy to understand because we haven't covered fixed income yet. But when a company wants to borrow money, they often what, issue what they call bonds. Now, the price of the bond in the market might be $100. But if an investor has got a big position in, the, in, the, in this bond and he or she needs to get out quickly, then they might only be able to get out $97. So this liquidity premium then needs to be taken into account. And then lastly, we've got the maturity premium. And, and the rule is like this, that the longer the maturity of the investment, the more investors need to be compensated for the higher risk. So if we as investors lend money to a company, let's say for a short period, like one year, and if the company is strong now, you know, in one year's time, everything should still be okay. So we should expect to get our money back without a problem. But if we start looking five years or, or 10 years down the line, then there's gonna be a lot of uncertainty and therefore we need to, and, and anything can happen. So therefore we need to be compensated for, for that extra risk. So the general rule then is that the longer the maturity of the investment is, the more we got to be compensated because there is higher risk. Great, so now we need to move then on to the effective annual yield, or some people also call it the effective annual rate. So what is this? This is, this is the rate investors earn after taking compounding into account. So compounding is when we earn interest on interest. So the effective annual yield that reflects the annual rate of return earned after adjusting for different compounding periods, because some investments pay their interest on a quarterly basis and other investments pay their interest on a monthly basis. So in order to compare apples with apples, what we need to do, we need to work out the effective annual yield of both of the investments. And this is how we do it. We start with the stated annual rate. So if we look over here, the stated, and the stated annual rate, this is now a simple rate, which means it doesn't account for the for compounding within the year. And we also call it the nominal rate, or in America, they call it the annual percentage rate. And this is always an annual rate. So what do we do with the stated annual rate? We divide it by M, which is the number of compounding periods per year. So for example, if the, if the investment pays interest on a monthly basis, then M is gonna be 12. 
Now what we need to do, we need to go back to school and think about our bod mass rule. Remember bod mass? So we start with the brackets first and then in the brackets, Division comes before addition, so that's why I started over here. So once we've worked this out over here, then we take one plus this 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 lot we worked out here. Then we put that to the power of the number of compounding periods per year. And once we've done all of that, then we take off one. So we are, are going to do an example in a minute to, to clear this up. But just before we get to the example, this stated annual rate divided by M, which is this over here. Let's just circle it like that. That is known as the periodic rate. So, so if they're kind enough <laughs> to give us the periodic rate on the exam, then we don't have, we mustn't divide by M. We just need to put, just got to take one plus that periodic rate, and then it's going to make life easier. Good. So let's then do the examples. So we, here we have an investment. The stated annual rate is 6%. So that is now the simple rate or what they also call the nominal rate. So they wanted to work out what's the effective annual yield if compounding is semi-annual. So what we're going to do, that, that's now in percentage, 6%. So to get rid of the six to, to get rid of to get rid of the percentage sign, we're going to divide by hundred. And so six percent then in decimals is going to be 0 0.06. So we're going to divide by two because we've got semi annual compounding. So we've got two compounding periods per year. And that's going to give us their 0.03 or 3%. So this means that the investor is going to earn 3% per six month period. So then we're going to add, we're going to take one plus that and we're going to get 1.03. Now we put that to the power of the number of compounding periods, which is two. We take off one and we get 6.09%. And this makes perfect sense that it's slightly higher than 6% because that 6% was a simple rate. But now if we, after six months, remember, we are going to earn our first bit of interest. So we're going to earn interest on interest. So we're going to get the, the effective annual yield is going to be slightly higher then than the stated annual rate or the simple or the nominal rate. So over here, I put in the, the calculator keys because of course, it's much easier to use the calculator. And unfortunately for the, if, if, if you're using the HP 12C, like I do, I think I'm one of the few, few people who still uses the HP 12C, but using the HP 12C, it's a bit more complicated. So I actually find it easier to use the formula. Uh, than, than trying to convert it using the HP 12C. So the reason I use the HP 12C is because that I got given this once many years ago as a gift when I joined a certain company and I, and I got used to it, but I like it now, but most people don't like it. So they prefer the Texas. So, but so there, 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 there are the keys there if you're using the Texas, which you probably are. So let's try the next example. Now it's the, actually the same as the previ previous example, except now we are, the interest is being compounded quarterly. So what we're going to do now, we're going to take the 6% the and divide by four because there's four quarters in a year, of course. So that's going to give us the 0 0.0015, which is 1.5%. So now the investor is going to get 1.5% per quarter. So that's another periodic rate. So we, we take one plus that, we're going to get 1.015, put that to the power of the number of compounding periods, take off our one, we're going to get 6.14%. Now this also makes sense that it's slightly higher than with the previous example, we had semi-annual compounding. Now we've got quarterly compounding. So now we, we're compounding more frequently. We're going to start earning interest on interest sooner because we now we've got four compounding periods per year, not two anymore. So it makes sense that the effective annual yield is slightly higher for quarterly compounding versus semi-annual. So like I say down at the bottom here, the more frequent the compounding, the higher the effective annual rate or the effective annual yield is going to be. And there are the calculator keys. Right. So now this is the, the last thing we need to look at for this class. And this is now rearranging the EAY formula. We can rearrange it to convert an effective annual yield to a stated annual rate or a nominal rate or a yield, or we can also just call it then the simple rate. So now we're going the other way around. So to work out our stated annual rate or our yield or our simple rate or our nominal rate, what we do is we, we, we take one 
plus whatever that effective annual yield is that they've given us. And we put that to the power of one over the number of compounding periods. And then we subtract one. And once we've done all of that, we multiply by the number of compounding periods per annum. So let's try the example. So we've got an investment, the effective annual yield at 6.14%. And they wanted to work out what is the stated annual rate if compounding is quarterly. So to get the 6.14% into decimals, again, we just divide that by 100. So it's going to be 0 0.0614 in decimals. So we take one plus that, and it's going to come 1.0614. And then we've got to put that now to the power of 1 over 4, because we've got four compounding periods per annum. And then we subtract 1. So this whole term over here, it comes out at 0 0.015. So once we've done all of that, we've got to multiply it by the number of compounding periods per annum, which is four, and then we're going to get 6%. And again, it makes perfect sense that the answer is 6%, because in the previous example, we were going the other way around. In the previous example, we started with a stated annual rate of 6%, and we had to work out the effective annual yield, which we did. We got to 6.14%. So now we're just doing the reverse here. We're starting with the effective annual, real, effective annual yield of 6.14%. So we would expect the answer then to be uh, on a stated annual rate of 6%. Good. So just before we run away from this class, I just wanted to mention that we may not see this formula very much in quants, but when we get to the fixed income reading, we're going to be doing something called the bond equivalent yield. And with that bond equivalent yield, once we've got the effective annual yield, which we can always work out if we haven't got it, once we've got the effective annual yield, we can then we can then plug it in here, and then we can work out the bond equivalent yield for any frequency that we like. So that we're going to be coming to much, much, much later. But I just wanted to mention it for now so that we, when we get there, hopefully we'll remember that we have seen this formula somewhere else before. Great. So that's the end then of that class. Hope it was helpful. And we'll see you guys in the next class. Hello, it's Tim here again. I hope you enjoyed the class and found it beneficial. We have some classes available for free on YouTube, but we have classes for the entire curriculum. The classes that are not on YouTube can be purchased from us. If you'd like to purchase the classes, please contact us for the pricing, and I've put our contact details over here. You can purchase all the classes or certain readings that you would like. When you purchase the classes, we provide you with the slides and our notes. I've assisted hundreds of candidates pass CFA exams, and I look forward to also helping you through the CFA program. I've put in two testimonials in the slide over here, and we also have a testimonials page at, on our website that you can review. I look forward to seeing you soon and all the best.